last lecture in our course. The goal of this course was to introduce you to the exciting field of neuroscience, and I truly hope that you see it as an exciting field. It goes without saying that we have barely scratched the surface of what is known, and what is known is only a small part of what is yet to be known. And so it's like describing this huge iceberg, and what we know is that little snowflake just at the top we can see. And so there's a great deal left that we need to understand about the brain, but I hope that you feel in this course that you've learned a lot that provides you with foundation material that will allow you to go on and learn more and also have the desire to go on and learn more. Here we've tried to stay with a sort of a global appreciation of the brain so that you can understand how it's organized, how it functions, or at least how we think it functions, um, and also basically to just help you learn about what kinds of questions neuroscientists are interested in asking um, and maybe a little bit of the insight into why some of the questions are very, very difficult. In science, however, there's something else which is also true. We have in all of the scientific fields become more and more reductionistic. And this has happened all over in science and the same is true of neuroscience. So there's a whole other layer of knowledge that has only been hinted at in this course that actually exists. And it would just be a shame to have a course in neuroscience and not to at least appreciate that this other layer of knowledge is in fact available if you're interested in pursuing it. And that is the information we have gained about how the brain functions at a cellular and molecular level. We've learned that even those things that appear to be very simple processes are actually incredibly complex. So for example, when we talked about synaptic transmission, I said that there's an action potential that comes down the axon, and this action potential causes the influx of calcium at the presynaptic terminal. Then that influx of calcium causes these vesicles to fuse with the presynaptic membrane and to release their contents into the cleft. Well, that all sounds very simple and everything, and it turns out there's an incredible number of molecular and biochemical cascades that have to occur in order for that to happen. And we know a great deal on a molecular level of the exact molecules that are involved and what has to happen. But the diagrams are so complicated, you can hardly put all the information on the diagram itself. And this is all knowledge that we understand at a molecular level. Another example that you can relate to is what we've learned about learning and memory. So in our lecture on learning and memory, we talked about all the different ways that synapses can be dynamic. So one of the things we mentioned is that a synapse can be more efficacious. So a synapse might release more neurotransmitter under certain circumstances, thereby influencing the postsynaptic cell more. Well, that's wonderful and that's true, but it turns out again there are many, many, many molecular and biochemical cascades that have to occur for that to take place. And we actually have paradigms that are studied in the dish, in the animal, whatever, in which we have identified many of the molecules that are involved in this and many of the processes that are involved. So, for example, in my own laboratory, I was interested in a protein called GAP43 that seems to play a role in nerve regeneration in animals or systems in which nerves are capable of regenerating and also plays a role in synaptic plasticity. And so we use the hippocampus as the model system. My entire research was directed towards understanding under what conditions phosphate groups were either added or taken off of this one molecule. And we're talking about a very complicated event. And so this is all knowledge that is known on a molecular level that we have not covered in this class because it just simply isn't possible to cover everything. And ultimately, I think most of us as neuroscientists, what we want to be able to do is put all of the pieces of the puzzle together and understand how the brain works. But you saw the problems in being able to define something like consciousness 
So what we've done is we've gone down to a level that we can control, that we can do experiments with. And so that it's just important for you to be able to understand it. One of the things that I think is so exciting about neuroscience is that no matter how much you learn, no matter how much you know, there'll always be more to know and more to understand. And so this is a field that is just ripe for individuals who want to keep their own brains alive by always incorporating new information and understanding um, the system. It also goes without saying, and I just have to bring this back into play here, uh, this is our little circuit board, and we talked about how difficult it would be to reverse engineer just this one little circuit board if you didn't have a book to tell you what all the components meant and all the rest of this. Well, I think here at the end of the course, you probably have a really, really, really good feeling about why we're having difficulty understanding this. It's a great deal more difficult and complex than any circuit board that any human being has ever designed and is ever likely to design. And so we can speculate all we want about things, but we don't have any instruction booklet. And so we're trying on whatever level that we're looking at the nervous system on is to just understand the pieces. And hopefully at some point, someone will be able to come along and put it together. In our brains, which is different from this circuit board, we have a dynamic system. And this is something that all neuroscientists are intimately aware of. We don't just have hard wiring, we have incredible soft wiring. And so our system is dynamic and that makes it difficult to study as well because it can undergo very rapid change that can obviously change things very, very quickly. So what I'd like to do though is to just step back a little bit and look over the material that we have covered. And I'm not going to cover all the facts that we've looked at and everything, but I just wanted to talk about some general conclusions that I hope you will have taken away from this course. And do I care that you do remember some specific facts? Yes, I do. But I also care that you see the information in a more global way. So first of all, what conclusion do I want you to draw? First and foremost, I want you to draw the conclusion that it is the brain and not the heart or the ventricles that gives rise to the mind. So while we can look back and we can appreciate that in those early days when people were thinking about, the natural philosophers were thinking about what constituted the mind, what was responsible for cognition and perception, we can understand that they were thinking about things in terms of fluids and the heart pumps fluid through the body. So that sort of made sense. That's a, a reasonable paradigm. Or we could think about these holes in our brain, these ventricles, individuals thinking about a spirit that might imbue us with something special. So it made sense that these early natural philosophers thought in terms of the heart or the ventricles or whatever. But I hope you have drawn the conclusion that in fact it is the brain that gives rise to the mind. Another conclusion would be that perception and cognition, so our ability to perceive an external world, to appreciate it, our ability to think about it or have self-reflection, to think, to reason, is also the result of underlying brain processes. The brain gives rise to the mind. The brain gives rise to our subjective sense of experience. We don't know how it does it, but we're sure that it does. Everything we see, hear, feel, think or do is the result of underlying brain processes. And I want you to take that with you because this is really important. It's the neural activity of our brains that allow for our ability to have experience in the world. And we've seen from our clinical examples that the corollary of this is also true, and that is anything can be taken away with the right brain lesion. You can lose selectively nouns from your speech. You can lose the ability to distinguish dogs from cats or roses from lilies. You can lose the ability to apply morality um, to ethical decisions. You can lose your sense of self. All of these things can be lost 
with the right brain lesion. Another of the conclusions I hope you've been able to make from our discussions is that emotions can be a very positive force in our lives, guiding us and helping us to make rational decisions that are for our own well-being. We might not be able to control our genes, but our brains are incredibly plastic. And this means that we can learn to modify our reactions in a way that allows emotions to guide us in positive ways in decision-making that can enhance the quality of our lives. So emotions are not bad guys. We have this incredible elaboration of emotional experience. This allows us to make the decisions that are directed towards survival and directed towards an enjoyment of life. We have an endogenous reward system that can be activated. We have a natural system in our brains that is designed to help us enjoy life, enjoy our experiences, enjoy meeting new people, enjoy interacting with others, enjoy being part of life. I think it's time for us to let go of Descartes to let go of the legacy. It's time for us to basically incorporate emotions as a very positive force in our lives and integrate this into our behaviors so that all of us can live on this planet together and that we can all experience the joy of being alive. Now, another um, uh, conclusion I'd like you to draw is that, in fact, we do have this incredible plasticity. And I want you to know that we can have this until we're in our hundreds. We can always learn. We have this incredible plasticity, even if we don't understand every molecular and cellular event that's taking place. We can learn all of our lives. And this plasticity can also go towards helping us live lives that are very rich, help us enjoy the journey of life. We talked about a few of the known mechanisms that underlie synaptic plasticity, but it's just incredible. I think there's probably more to be discovered than we know. Just before I came for this taping here for this course, I read a scientific article which was very compelling in which the author was talking about how, you know, we always think of this is a synapse and there's a synapse here and you have synaptic vesicles here and synaptic vesicles here. Very compelling evidence that adjoining synapses can actually share synaptic vesicles depending on who needs them the most at the given time. This is an incredible plastic event. We have no idea how this takes place. But I think there's many more mechanisms than we have yet discovered. And yet we had an entire lecture about all the different ways that the brain can be plastic. Also... One of the most important, I think, of the conclusions I want you to draw from this class is that we need to treat our brains with respect. And we can't control our genetics, but we control many factors that are going to lead to a healthy, active brain. You probably already knew this, but what I hope is that this course has reinforced that for you and has caused you to maybe look at it in a little bit different light. Um, how important this is. These are the major conclusions. And again, it's not that I don't care that you don't remember something about the visual pathway or how we walk or talk or something like that. I do want you to remember those things. But I also want you to walk away with a more global appreciation of the brain and its function in our lives. I also jotted down some challenges that I think face neuroscience. And these are only mine, so you know it isn't that all neuroscientists would agree with this, but I just put down some things that I think that are especially challenging for us, and I want to tell you why. So this is sort of me sharing part of myself and how I view my own field. One of the challenges that we face is to unravel the underlying causes and mechanisms of many neurological and psychiatric disorders. This is one that I think all neuroscientists and neurologists would, in fact, agree with. We've made some important advances. There's no doubt about that, particularly in our understanding of disorders like Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis. We've made incredible advances in our understanding of what is going on in these disorders, but we have a lot more to learn. We are just beginning 
to understand some other disorders and understanding what's going on in the underlying neural mechanisms involved in disorders like autism, attention deficit disorder, schizophrenia. And one of the reasons some of these disorders have been so difficult for us to understand is because we couldn't really understand them till we went down on a molecular level. So some of the changes that result in incredible changes in the person's behavior actually occur at a molecular level. So you can't see them when you look with MRI always, unless you know exactly what you're looking for. You can't always see them on a gross level. And so we're actually making inroads now into some disorders that have been a total enigma as to what they were about. And so we are learning about the underlying neural mechanisms, but we need to learn a lot more. We've made the best inroads in disorders that have a genetic component to them. And this should really make sense to anyone who knows anything about biology. If we can identify a gene, then we can identify what that gene codes for. And we can figure out if there's a mutation or there's a difference in that gene, what that results in. And so we've made the most headway where we've had a genetic component to disorders. So, for example, even the genetics of individuals who have a familial form of Alzheimer's, we've made great headway there. But we also need to de learn a great deal more about sporadic forms or idiopathic forms of all these disorders that don't appear to have a genetic component. We need to learn if there's something about our environment that's inducing changes. We need to learn more about this. And so this is really important. At the same time we do this, and we learn about the etiology or the cause of these disorders, we also need to spend a great deal of effort um, also determining how we can help individuals who already have the disorders. And I think we need to make greater strides in terms of treatment. Now, we've already done a good job in this. Um, and I decided to pull an example here, which was one we didn't really talk about, but one that great strides have been made in. We now know that migraine headaches are a central nervous system disorder. We know the neurotransmitters that are involved, and it's serotonin and dopamine. And we have made enormous strides in being able to treat this disorder in individuals who have suffered for years with it by being able to manipulate those two neurotransmitters. And before, I mean, years ago, we didn't even realize that it had anything to do with the nervous system in particular. We certainly didn't see it as a nervous system disorder. So all of our underlying knowledge about neuroscience can, in fact, inform us as to what we need to do to help with treatments. We saw in Parkinson's disease that we can do deep brain stimulation. We can place electrodes in the brain of individuals. We can stimulate to either stimulate a nucleus or maybe create a functional lesion, however it works. And we can help people live good, productive lives. Well, it turns out there are reports now that deep brain stimulation of specific areas can also relieve depression. So in individuals who do not respond to antidepressant drugs, now there's another treatment option. Of course, I want to go back that we still need the major push to be in our understanding of what these diseases are about and what causes them so we can try to prevent them. But understanding more and more about every one of these disorders is also going to help us design programs and treatments that will help those individuals who already suffer from the disorders. Another challenge that I think faces neuroscience is to understand individual differences. And this is one that I'm very interested in. Ultimately, we want to understand why some individuals become alcoholics, for example, whereas other individuals do not. Now, we've made great strides here, too, because we know that in the individuals who become alcoholics, there are genetic factors at work. And so we've actually, again, made great strides. But there are other ways that there are individual differences that are really important. For example, why is it that some individuals who suffer abuse as children are scarred for life, emotionally and physically to the point that they have hippocampal atrophy, that they actually kill neurons in their brain, Whereas another individual who might have been subjected to even greater abuse on some objective level 
isn't scarred for life? What is it about this individual that protected them? We need to understand how there's this gene environment interaction. We need to understand these things or how changes are made in the brain and how individual differences play a role. I would agree very strongly with the psychiatrist Kay Jamison. There are a number of her books uh, in the bibliography that are recommended. She suffer, is a psychiatrist who suffers from uh, manic depressive episodes, bipolar, wrote a wonderful book called Exuberance. And in this book, she talks about, yes, we need to understand depression. Yes, we need to do this. But we equally need to understand why some people have an exuberance of life. We need to be able to understand individual ways that individuals develop ways of coping in the world and why this one person is able to draw on this system and maybe someone else is not. I would add something to that. Not only are exuberant people worthy of being studied, but I think we also need to study individuals who are raised in homes, for example, in which there's a great deal of racism or sexism we need to understand why one individual raised in those conditions is sexist and racist themselves and never has that self-reflective nature to think about what this means in a social sense. Whereas another individual who could be raised in an environment that's very similar is able to turn a self-reflection or to think about things in a way that causes them to be able to break away from that code. We are, you know, in the old days, we were raised in a family, and what we were exposed to were the morals or values, the mores of our culture, were actually communicated to us by our families, our immediate family members. We live in a different world now. We live in a world of TV and Internet. We live in a very different world, and and the codes that we develop, our moral behavior, how we make it into a code and we use it to Uh, act in the world and to make moral decisions is now influenced by many other things as well. And we need to understand why one person that's damaging to, yet another person it is not. And so this whole concept of individual differences fascinates me because we need to study those people who were raised a certain way and yet break away from it. We need to understand what is it they're drawing on that allows them to do this. And I think it will tell us about some very fundamental aspects of the brain and what's going on in the brain. Another challenge, we need to understand more about global or distributed brain processes. So this would include consciousness, but it would also include memory, intelligence, and creativity. And so these are more distributed processes. For example, IQ. You know, we could argue whether IQ means anything, but whether it does or not isn't the issue. Short of having massive brain damage, what we call IQ doesn't change. There isn't like a specific area like we thought here with Fred Phrenology, one specific area where your intelligence is located. It's a more distributed ability that has many different dimensions to it. And we need to understand that. We need to be able to understand that. Again, we've made some headway. So, for example, we learned that the left hippocampus plays a role in episodic memory that gets strung together into this autobiographical story, where now we've learned that parts of this prefrontal area that's so important in humans for other things as well needs to be intact and is involved in the consolidation of that episodic memory into long-term memory. So a long-term sense of who we are is consolidated there. So this is very important. We need to understand more about how memory becomes long-term. Notice we didn't talk much about long-term memory. So these are distributed processes that we know very little about. We have learned something about creativity, at least a little bit, and there are a number of psychiatrists and uh, neuroscientists are very interested in this. We've learned that mental illness is not a barrier to creativity. And while we might have sort of known that, you could look at it another way. It turns out that almost a disproportionate number of individuals who have been highly creative have in fact suffered from some kind of psychiatric disorder like chronic depression or schizophrenia. 
And so not only is it not a barrier, there might be something about the way their brains is processing information that allows them to think more outside of a box or something. And there are individuals whose entire research programs are devoted to an understanding of highly creative people and the kind of emotional temperaments and ways of viewing the world that they have. We're also studying individuals who have isolated talents. So there are research programs that are looking at individuals who are called savants, Individuals who on some level appear to not be very high on the level of cognitive ability, yet have some kind of extraordinary talent that allows them to do things that we can only stand in amazement at. So um, these individuals are likewise being studied. A last challenge, I think, but I think one that's especially important and very dear to me, is that we need to understand the brain processes that underlie human behavior in the social realm. And this is something that hasn't really been a focus of neuroscience until very, very recently. We are social beings, and our brains are shaped not just by experience in a world of objects, but by our experience with other people. And we need to understand the processes that are involved here. We may have an instinct for morality like we have for language. We need to understand that. I like, um, I'm always reminded when I talk about like empathy or morality and these things, is Schopenhauer is credited with saying that um, compassion is the basis of all morality. And now we're discovering that there are areas of the brain where neurons actually fire when we observe the suffering of other people. And perhaps this is part of the underlying mechanism of empathy. And perhaps this is, on a neurological level, how we learn to feel sympathy and empathy towards others. And I will also tell you that there's research that indicates that individuals who uh, commit multiple murders or who have a certain type of sociopathy do not show activation of these neurons when they view the suffering of other people. And so we're making great strides, but it's a challenge to understand what is going on in the normal brain. But it's important for us because we live in a world with other people. And I think that neuroscience stands in a very critical position to be able to contribute to this field by being able to contribute what we have learned about the brain and how we learn about the underlying neural mechanisms. So we need to interact with sociologists, we need to interact with psychologists, we need to just interact with each other so that we can learn about how the brain is influenced by our social interaction with other beings and how it is we come, or some people come, to have a care and concern for individuals who aren't part of our in-group individuals who aren't actually our brothers and sisters, but are on some kind of emotional level. Because we live in that flat world, and I think it's extremely important that we learn about these mechanisms in the brain, and hopefully that this will give us some insight that will be helpful to us in living very good and enriched lives with others. So it's time for me to say goodbye. You've been wonderful students. I'm going to give you all an A, and I think that may be important to you. I don't know. Um, At the beginning of our course, I said that my goal as your professor and guide was to inform you and to amaze you. I hope you've been informed, and I also hope that you've been amazed. I've pointed out a lot of paradigms that have been busted along the way in our learning uh, something about the brain and how it's organized. Well, surely there are going to be many more paradigms. What I've tried to do is to provide you with foundation knowledge so that when that individual knowledge changes or we throw a fact out or we bust a paradigm, it doesn't matter because you have a foundation of knowledge that will allow you to go on and learn more. I've provided an extensive bibliography with this course, and I strongly encourage you to just pick and choose and pick some things. It doesn't matter if you understand every single thing that's said. You will understand enough to appreciate the author's argument and where they're coming from. 
And so I would like to end the course by sharing with you my very favorite quote. And this favorite quote doesn't come from a fellow neuroscientist. It actually comes from the astronomer John Barrows. And it is, every molecule of carbon in our bodies originated in the stars. I just think that's beautiful. We're all connected. And I think it is just absolutely fantastic that we have a brain that is capable of comprehending this, that we have a brain that's able to have this subjective experience of our lives, that we have a brain that we can have self-reflection, that we can love others, that we can care about other people. What a journey we're on. And this is all due to this incredible brain. Thank you. Thank you very much.